a thing, you know, it was, um, it's nice, man. It's nice to have those things with the kids and I hope that they can, um, yeah, just when they get older, you know, you don't have like core memories. No, I think, yeah, you think about like, obviously we was a lot talk about childhood now, um, in the sense of like how it impacts us as from adults and sure. how healthy we are as adults. And, uh, yeah, like everyone, everyone I know has got kids. So it's just kind of like this whole thing where uh, I'm seeing different people raise their kids in a different way. For sure. And like, I've been having quite a lot of conversations around that actually, where um, you've got some parents that are kind of like, so like we, you probably grew up similar to me where parents didn't have that much money. Yeah. So it wasn't exactly like you got everything you wanted. No, man. Um, and there was a little bit of maybe like hustling as you kind of came up just to Absolutely. get some of the things that you wanted to get. Now we're in a slightly different situation where we're maybe making a bit more money than our parents did. Um, we're a little bit more materialistic than our Oh, I would say so, man. So I'm seeing some of my friends, like when it comes to their kids, their kids are getting PlayStation, iPad, Jordans, fresh trim they're already gone on like two holidays a year yeah for sure all of this stuff on the other side like that wasn't my experience personally like my my childhood i got what i wanted i was the only child no, I, no, no. I know it's bad <laughs> but like but also i don't think my mum and dad didn't necessarily have the money for that but they like and i think my mum still is paying some of that stuff off now man. Wow. do you know what i mean like that was how it was so it actually made me be more like I'm more not I wouldn't say I'm tight but like I'm more like I think a lot about having money backed up or having uh, being able to you know if there's something happened I couldn't work for this amount of time or that amount of time what would I do and I think up until probably only really like last year or even like the last 18 months or so I would have been fucked if I couldn't you know I had no money behind me. We're living like pay t- paycheck to paycheck. And it's only really in this last kind of like 18 months or so that I've been able to actually start putting some money to the side and being able to do that. But then at the same time, we have had two holidays this year and we have, you know, the kids get, I don't, sp- I wouldn't say I spoil the kids, but I want them to have nice things, you know, you do. And But I think also, I think that, Maybe because we were younger back then, we don't remember it as well. But I think these days, because consumerism is literally just everywhere in your face the whole time. Like we might see adverts on the TV when we were young, watching Nickelodeon or something. And we'd be like, I want that. Or we might see a billboard or something like that. But now literally advertising is just all over you the whole time. Like from the moment you get up, like my kids have got phones. So the moment they get up, they're looking if they're on their phone advertising straight away it's on them which we didn't have at that level yeah and the level of everything these days is just wild there's been so much happening like in your face the whole time so that didn't really occur to me because i'm just think I, I don't have any kids so i'm just thinking about it like i'm getting all these the algorithms from adverts of me yeah exactly but i forgot that kids are also kind of huge man and it's a whole different story for them because i might just be like oh, listen just relax yeah yeah you don't need to be buying all that kids are wild though oh <laughs> uh, so, like a, a massive example of this would be you know the prime drink yeah oh my god the prime drink i didn't really understand what was going on i didn't understand either but i was outside asda at five in the morning with my son banging down the door to try and get some really yeah bro mad I, I i thought about my life when i was there <laughs> do you know what i mean like he's there like but because the kids they don't have if you've got a habit you know you don't want to be that person at school that doesn't have it interesting or you really want to be that person that school that has it and that what that how that elevates you they, they, they go mad for it and my son even was like to me i said to him i was like bro this doesn't even taste that good he's like no i prefer lucas aid i was like oh, what are we doing then man what's going on that's cool what, what do you what do you mean i remember i asked my friend this question because he's got two two kids and he's definitely like they've got ipads um phones playstation name it and i said how can you know like why are you why do you get all these things right um because 
aren't you like a little bit concerned that they would then be a little bit spoiled and they wouldn't then have that sort of desire to try and get these things themselves? And he's just like, yeah, but bullying. For sure. And then I was just like, really? And he's like, yeah, man, like if you, if your kids don't have all these things, they're the ones that end up getting bullied. For sure. And I was just, it's tough, man. It's tough. Even for like, the, like how they look like it's so cruel but i think it was the same man like you'd always have something that you'd get like everyone would always have something like my son like i'm i know i'm biased but my son is beautiful like he's a good looking boy like he really is but his friends tell him he's got a big forehead uh -huh. you know what i mean and so i see him in the morning and he's come downstairs and he's doing his hair and he's like with his hair and he's trying to make sure and i'm like why are you pushing your hair down like that and he's like oh Cause I'm trying to, I'm like, you're trying to hide your forehead, aren't you? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, mate, what is that? Oh, and man. I was like, all these kids, I was like, well, your friend looks like a weasel, man. <laughs> like, I can't, and don't let these things get to you like that. It's mad. He literally, you know what I mean? Like, come on. That is, it's crazy. That is pretty crazy. I don't know. I don't really remember. Um, I remember being bullied for not having things or not having money or whatever. Um, Maybe I was a bit oblivious to what was going on. Yeah, for sure. And I don't think everybody had stuff. There wasn't as much stuff to have, I think. Agreed. There's a, an abundance of different things that you have to have these days. Whereas before, there really was like, there'd be like maybe the craze of the time, like mm -hmm. Pokemon cards or I remember yo-yos. And that, that jacket. jacket. Yeah. It, do you know what I'm saying? They had, they used to have the climber fit hats. Yeah. Oh my God. TNs. Like. There was a thing of the moment that you would have. And like, if you had it that like, yeah, but it was like one thing. Yeah. One thing. Now there's thousands of things all together at the same time. And he'll move. My son moves from one thing to the next. And I'm like, bro, we only just got this. Like, what are we doing? So I have another question I probably think about around that stuff is how the parents afford to give their kids all of these things. Cause I know like, I might, uh, like a pair of trainers is 150 pounds, right? Like a pair of Jordans, for example, and it could be even more than that. Um, now I know they're probably not like buying a new pair every single month, mm. but then a PlayStation with a game and that's like another 700 pound. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I remember a situation, um, with, uh, Fortnite. Oh, my situation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like so I block so, that out. So, then, so now, like they've got games that then are also costing money for like yeah, yeah thief little thief mm -hmm. as well. It's the same purchases and stuff. Well, not that like, thief anymore. EAFC or whatever. And I was just thinking to myself, obviously, fine. There are going to be some families that can afford to give their kids these things, but there's definitely, definitely a lot of families that don't. So uh, for sure. Your your kids go to like regular schools. Yeah. So they're going to regular schools, which means that they're going to school with all the other kids. Um, that means that there's a whole bunch of kids in those schools that like they come from homes who can't afford to buy them. Yeah, for sure. And all that stuff is like, well, what happens to them? I just see, yeah, it's true. What does happen to them? There will be, I think like, when I used to, if you think about my, if I think about my own school, they would have like people sit mostly in like, there's like a tier, right? Not, not just in it, in for, for everything. They're not necessarily just for like wealth, but like maybe for how academically smart you are as well. Like you would have not, not to be rude, but you'd have the, the dumb kids. Then you'd have the really smart kids. Then you'd have like middle of the road mm -hmm. is where I sat. They kind of. Yeah, we're all good, but you know, I'm not going to win a Nobel prize or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like there's not, I'm not going to Oxford, you know what I mean? And I think there's probably a scale like that for most things in life, like where you sit on that scale, I think mm -hmm. there will be always those, those families that don't have, and I think at the moment there's, that's becoming more big. That's a government thing that, you know, right. Yeah. That's politics, bro. Getting into that. You know, like, that's a lot of chat, but like the living, right? Yeah, exactly. It's funny though, because we do have the cost of living crisis now and it is very real. Like my food shop used to be a hundred pound, 120. I'm now looking at 200 pound a week. So like it's real, 
it's a real like when you you can look at it in real terms and I can be like, cool, we're not buying any more stuff than than what we used to buy, but that there's another eighty pounds every week. It's a, it's massive. It is huge. So crazy. you know what I mean? But also, I don't know, I think for me, obviously, even when you knew me, well, when you knew me, you knew me for eight, but like even when we worked together, I was the only person in the house that was earning money. And I think after COVID, when Holly started working, that made it, that was massive for us because then all of a sudden we were two salary mm. household. And I think that makes a big difference, man. To I think if you're looking at single parent household, that's so tough. Like, I don't know how people do it. That is cr- so hard. Whereas having having support there financially, knowing that she's earning money, because I would be, you know, I'd be getting my salary and then giving over half away within within 10 minutes of having it in my account, it would be gone. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas now we have like our ways that we split things in in the house so like she'll do this i'll do that but then i don't have to, i'm not giving out to just for the sake do you know what i mean just yeah. just to just to keep everything not looked after so that's what it's kind of like allowed me to to start to be able to think okay what am i what am i able to put away what am i able to do here and I think yeah those that are just on a single income household at, at this time it's oh man i can only imagine well it seems especially with kids like yeah, I think that, so another thing that kind of like I looked at recently was, um, I remember asking ChatGPT this as, huh, right? Like who, who's interested in, um, like, the, all these different products that you find in like fitness, like, you know, these whoop bands and all this other kind of stuff. And it did spit back and I've now read articles that kind of like, um, are consistent with the answer that ChatGPT gave me, which is it's generally people in the sort of upper middle economic classes and above. Yeah, people that can afford to care about their health and well being. Sure. Um, and it means that it's the market's getting pushed more to like the smaller percentage of people who have the money to to look after their health, and then everybody else below that socioeconomic like. Um, Ryan is getting overlooked. Uh, you're you work in well, you've now just recently gone over to First Base in Canary Wharf, right? Yeah, so I'm there. I had been a month, I was yeah, and I was at Tower Bridge before foremost two years, man. But both of those, I mean, it's third space, which you know, the monthly it's like 200 pounds a month over, yeah, I mean, over 200 a month, over 200 just for, just for one but one site. You're like multi multi access. You're looking at two twenty. The likelihood is two thirty. Anyone who's a member there is generally in that sort of upper middle, absolutely, um, or middle socioeconomic class. Um, so they can afford to uh, invest in these like really top tier facilities. They probably care about um, you know their their boot bands and uh, you know what protein. Then maybe they drink prime drinks as well. <laughs> probably some of them. I would imagine. That. Knockos. I mean, knockos are expensive, man. Um, do you know how much a knocko is at third space? £3.50. That's insane. £3.50. That seems... I don't actually know how much... I actually have two knockos a day. Okay. Uh, and I don't know how much I pay for it exactly. But do you get them... Do you buy, bulk buy them? I buy bulk and I buy it from the, the cafeteria as well. Okay. Um, but it doesn't save me that much. I mean, it saves me some money, but like... Not a huge amount. Yeah, three sisters. Um, so, like, the amount that it costs to be an adult who wants to look after and be fit and look after their health um, and pursue fitness in, like, the very sort of um, cool way that it's kind of, like, become a culture, cultural thing now. Yeah, to be able to track everything and looking at how much sleep I've had or looking at, you know, looking at, oh, how many... How many calories did I burn there or whatever? At least like, even the clothes, right? Like back in the day, you would turn up in some Lonsdale hoodie. <laughs> from sports Absolutely. Absolutely. Sports and direct, some, you know, some, I don't know how old those added as track pants and your, and your trainers and whatever. Now you've got like 70 pound Lululemon um, gym training t-shirt or 
50, 50, 60 pounds t-shirt from Gymshark, um, like trainers, uh, I don't. Uh, you, you can't talk to me about. You. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we are done. I'm done talking about trainers. Um, <laughs> I'm done. I, I can't because uh, yeah. <laughs> so you you've been you've been um, posting a lot about this uh, the brand Rad Global, right? Rad Global, yeah. Man. <laughs> oh wait, what what's going on there? What are they? Uh, so <laughs> Rad Global. I need a sponsorship. Rad. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I've been trying to get a sponsorship. I'm wearing a pair now, so. This is their, these are their running shoes. Um, okay. Mad comfortable. I've got another pair in my bag. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Um, Rad Global. I'm very particular with my footwear. So for a long time, I would only wear, uh, for training, for work, I'd wear Reebok Nanos. I had, in my left foot, I had, um, most shoes will cause me like quite a lot of pain uh, in my foot, at the bottom of my foot when I walk. So like if I buy a pair, even when I bought my dunks, bought a pair of dunks just to walk around, but I take I have to wear them around the house for days before I can wear them out because right. they'll hurt my foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for work, when I'm coaching, especially like I've, a normal shift for me is it's an eight hour day, but five of those hours I'm on my feet, demoing movements, running around, jumping around. So like I'm, it's a act, it's very active what I do. So I needed to be, I need the footwear to to see me through those days. So I was found these Reebok Nanos and a wide toe box, really nice. I was like, I'm not going to use anything else. They're the ones. Um, and then just, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know why, but just by, there was a few of my friends, uh, for my colleagues at third space who, 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 you know, they'd be like, oh, this company rad, the shoes are really good. And there was a hype around them. And it was the hype that drew me in because it's like they, the way that they work is they used to do a drop. But that drop would then, you would have to be online on the drop. And then within like two, three minutes, shoes gone, done, see you later. And if you, they would never restock a colorway. So once the, if you didn't, if you wanted that colorway and it's gone, finished. And it's a, it's a sick marketing thing, man. And they push sustainability. So when they first started, they would only make a certain amount of, uh, each shoe. That's why. So, and they had those, those orders kind of backed up for the drops so they had they were like this is what we'll project we're going to sell but obviously the demand then massively outweighed what they'd produced which is now it's not there's not as much anymore like you can get them now quite readily like if you went online now you'd probably be able to get your size and quite in a, in quite a lot of the kind of ways that they've done but at the at the start it wasn't like that it would be like cool if i want a size nine and a half the drops at 11 i've got to be on their 1059 refreshing getting ready and so I got my first pair and I was like, cool, put them on. Oh my God, this is the most comfortable shoe I've ever put on in my life. Wow. Like hands down, like you can't, this uncomparable, the training shoes from running them, from lifting them, working them, could walk around in them all day. Could do, do, I could hike in them 10 hours wouldn't, and they wouldn't hurt my foot at all, which is unheard of. Even though nanos that I first wear them, I'd have to wear them in. I was like, cool, I'm hooked. And then the hype got me. So the next drop would come and I'm like, I like that kind of way. I got it. And then the next drop would come and I'd be like, I shouldn't, I like that kind of way. And I would buy it. And then I think I've got 11 pairs now. <laughs> 11 pairs. I'm a, I'm a rad slut. They it is what it is. Really should sponsor you. Um, they should. I need that sponsorship or. Just the just the code, man. <laughs> I've got like I think probably it's in it's low teens, high twenties for the amount of people that like, individually that I've bought them just because I've said you've got to get them. And now put and now have multiple pairs. I mean that's a pretty strong um uh, endorsement of them to be fair. Like you you know, like, I definitely know the challenge of like looking for the right footwear. Um I've got I've just stopped like this year really buying trainers and stuff mainly because one, I was kind of like looking into why I was buying so much stuff anyway. And there may have been some other like deep rooted, um, things that I wasn't dealing with. Yeah. So I was like, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I'm by buying this, I'm trying to avoid something else for sure Two, I realized like the reason I, I wear the Puma RSX quite a lot yeah and I, I kind of fell into that sort of like 
lots of different colorways. I was getting them very cheap as well because I knew where to buy them from. Yeah. And uh, they were so, 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 so comfortable. But they weren't for training. They were just good for walking around in. Yeah, just to have them. And But then I started buying Nikes and then I got all these different types of Nikes. And then now, like, I realized, like, switching trainers a lot was messing up with my, it was messing my feet up. So I was getting all these little ankle knocks, a little bit of injuries here and there. And then I started like, when I was like doing running, yeah. um, I needed, I, I suddenly realized like, yeah, like I've got a wider foot. Some of the running trainers were a bit too narrow. All of these issues started coming up and I was like, okay, it just makes sense to kind of stick to one trainer, one brand, one that, you know, fits your foot very well and not mess about with it too much. So now I've got all these trainers that I never wear. I'm I'm about to like um, give them away actually, uh, just because like some of them they're, they're still pretty fresh. I spent a lot of money on them for sure, and I'm about to just like send them on. See you later. Away because there, there's no point. I'm never going to wear them, and they're too well comfortable, and, and I'm not going to be doing like spending like days walking around in the house with them or whatever. For sure, I don't know one. I'm just going to simplify it now. Um, but it's really interesting listening to you there because. We were talking about your son earlier, right? And we were talking about how he needed to have certain things. He needed, you know, you guys were five in the morning banging on the door at as well for this point. <laughs> Tell you, man, I'm no, I'm no different. <laughs> I know. You've kind of got like, you know, if we take a look at what's happening with kids and how they're being marketed to and then what's happening with adults in this, especially in the fitness space, in the last 10 years, there's now all of these brands that are like targeting, it's become like an identity thing, right? For sure. Where um, some people will, will only wear Gymshark stuff. They'll wait for the sale. They'll wait for Yeah, you're a Gymshark guy. Yeah, you, you're a Gymshark. I'm not a Gymshark right. guy. Right, I'm not a Gymshark guy. I, I, you are. Um, I recently started wearing um, Lululemon t-shirts, right? They're really expensive. So expensive. They're really expensive. But they're so nice. <laughs> They're, they they fit super well. Yeah. And here's what happens. Here's, this, is where, this is where you get really screwed over. It's as soon as you put these things on, it's the response that you get from other people. Yeah. Suddenly, it's just like, you you know, um, especially a lot of this stuff is designed to make your, phys uh, like your physique hot. Yeah. So even if you've got some muscle, you don't actually need to be like this uh, Instagram level for sure, physique. You just need to have some muscle, and then the, the, it's almost like the t-shirt is designed to so just know it. It hugs the right places. It stays loose in the right places. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, for sure. And when you're in the gym, and then it fills you with confidence, and it's probably the same thing as when you've got, uh, you know, when you're 12 years old, and you or even older, and you've got a fresh pair of Jordans on, and everyone's just like, you know, gassing you up because you've got these like new trainers on. Um, we're, we're still behaving like 12 year olds. Absolutely. Worse, I reckon. I think I'm probably worse than he is. <laughs> just like, I think I can fight it, but I don't either. Like I just, if I want something now, if I want it enough, I'm just going to get it. It is what it is. We're, we're basically just, um, but you know, he's got to go through all that. He's got to ask me. He's got to ask. He's got to go through me. He's got to go through me, or he's got to go through his mum. Got to go through one of us. Yeah. So like, oh. he has to have a big, has to have like a big play for it to be worth it. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, he knows he's going to get shut down if it's not, if it's not, if it's not something he really needs, or if it's not something that he can really justify. Whereas for me, do I need another oversized t-shirt that's like ninety quid? No. But did they one just come out? Yeah, do I really like it? Yeah, oh shit, it's in my basket. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's crazy, it's crazy. But I actually try not, I try not to do that now. I started using these sites like Vinted and stuff like that. Right. It's actually a vibe. I got so this brand that I'm wearing now, Cole Buxton. This this hoodie is uh, brand new because they just launched it. But the the t-shirts and stuff that they do, they're like 85, 90 pound a pop. But I got two brand new with tags from, from Vinted for £30 each. Nice. Vibes. And I feel like a winner. And <laughs> like an absolute winner. It's, it's quite, um, it, it's still really, really amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm definitely withdrawing from buying stuff. 
now. Uh, one of the things that actually helped me was like this podcast, for example. I'm not going to go into how much all of this stuff cost me, um, but for anyone watching and like, you know, these are these are sure SM7Bs. My, every podcast in the world pretty much uses them. The Joe Rogan podcast uses them. Um, you can look it up for yourself and, and see how much I'm good, man. <laughs> I'm, like I'm, any of this stuff, right? Or... And I have more than two, right? So, yeah, uh, then like suddenly you want to, once you stop spending on all this kind of stuff, you're kind of like, ah, it's all about making you feel good, isn't it? Do I? Yes, it's kind of the same thing, right? So instead of buying trainers, when me buying lenses or cameras or whatever, at least this is getting used, right? And, it, and it's constructive towards something, but I've certainly got like, um, a lot of stuff, like, like it's almost the end of the year time of this recording and everyone kind of does their sort of fair outs at the end of the year and you're kind of like, well, there's all this stuff here that I didn't, I didn't use for the year. Um, I'm definitely throwing away like half of what I own. Yeah. Um, having a big clear out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a bit different. I think some people probably just like, no, nah, that's sick. I'm going to hold on to it. It's tough in it. I've got stuff that I need. I've, I did like, we try and do a couple a year where we'll just be like, cool, this is like done now. Do you know what I mean? I haven't, especially with clothes, be like, haven't worn this for a year. What am I doing? Yeah. It's not, I'm, it's not on, I'm not going to wear it again. But there's, yeah. Yeah, it's good to do it. It gives you a free feeling of like, yeah, things are fresh, you know, you're like, all right, cool. It's, yeah, I just, I do think to myself, like, we're all contributing to some of the social pressure that kind of goes into like, I, I, I obviously do one to one personal training, even though I'm in a commercial gym, I'm, I feel like I'm in a bit of a bubble. Um, and I'm not necessarily paying attention to like what everyone else is doing or wearing or like what trainers they have on. Um, you've kind of gone like way more into group exercise, right? Absolutely. And there's definitely like communities there where people kind of all like know each other. So there's a social element to it, I imagine. For sure. And, but I think also for me personally, like how you feel and when you're coaching, especially in a group, if I've got 24 people staring at me for an hour while we're, while I coach, if I take them for a workout, if I take them for a class, I have to feel like I look all right, man. I have to feel like I look good. So it's like from everything, that's not just like, clothes but that's like it's my here's my hair all is my trim right I smell all right my breath all right like all these things that all just add to give you more confidence does that make sense because you've got it's just all eyes on you it's like a show man this a lot of people that get into group x it's not me personally but they come from performance yeah yeah, yeah. and you see that like you can put on a good show if that makes sense it's, it's crazy. Whereas I come from a completely different side of it. Whereas like I come from PT, that's what I've always done. And so it's not, for me, it was never about the performance, but I realized more and more that it, you do have to be a showman as well when you do these things, even if it's understated, which I think for me, it definitely is. But I feel like my voice changes. I got, you don't have the same. I don't speak like this when I coach different. I found like so you're you're one of the um, you're one of the individuals that I think probably even influenced me a little bit with um, like turning up to work dressed in a particular way, right? Where the everything was color coordinated, <laughs> yeah. So the socks and the trainers <laughs> to the so a bunch of other things were kind of like you know little details that were occurring, like you roll up your sleeves and make sure everything's fitted nothing's too loose in the wrong places absolutely um you had a particular look that kind of worked with how you look yeah um and it was definitely something that you you, you probably didn't get on the first try right like it looks like you've kind of yeah it's, it's still evolving now over time oh yeah for sure um it's still happening now if so, I, I look back on like even that video that you you sent me the other day from uh, when we were Thai cookies, and I was like, "Wait!" <laughs> and I post pictures sometimes of like three, four years ago, five years ago, and people, are like, is that you? Is that the same person? I'm like, "Yeah, 
you go, yeah, your style seems to the glow up is real. <laughs> it changed a lot. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to draw a parallel to, to what we were talking about earlier was the kids, right? And the, the potential bullying and the not fitting in and the not being cool. Um, do you find that that happens like in these spaces where the groups are coming together and they're working out together? Are there people that turn up like not wearing Gymshark, not wearing Lulu now? Oh, yeah, for else what? And how do you think, what impression do you get? How are they feeling? Are they then treated differently? Mm. I, I'm not, you know me already, I've, I've not really been a group X person. For sure. I don't go to any of the classes. So I, and I kind of, it's a different world to mine to some extent. So I've not really paid attention to the like social dynamics. And is it, is it like that or are adults different? No, I would hope, I, I would like to say that it's not. Uh, like there's no judgment like that from personally I wouldn't it doesn't matter to me how you come to my session all that matters to me is that you have a have a good time first and foremost people will come to my session and you know it it's all obviously fitness is what we do right but for first and foremost before like we get a pb or we do we you know we push you to your limit, all these things that people like to try and like those cliches. I just want you to turn up and enjoy yourself because you turn up and you enjoy yourself means you come back next week. And it means I have another 45 minutes with you. Imagine I said to you, you've got 45 minutes with a, with a person and you've got to, you've got to change this, 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 you've got to do all this stuff. You'd be like, I can't do it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I might get this one person for 45 minutes a week. But I need so in that fir in those first encounters with them, those first times I meet them, for me it's just all about making sure that they're that they they leave feeling happier than when they came, because if they leave feeling happier, then they're more likely to come back. I've got more time to influence them, I've got more time to help them. I've got more time to help them grow in in their fitness or in whatever it is they want. I might not even find out what that is in the first time I meet them, and I might I'm, I'm not bothered because I haven't earned that right yet to to, to do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Have you, because for me, anyway, yeah, I feel like you have to earn that right as a coach for to take someone's goals and, you know, and care about them like that. You have to, it's not something that you can just be like, oh yeah, I care about that. It's not genuine. There's a, there's a little bit of, yeah, like it takes time to develop an organic relationship with somebody, especially do the setting, especially where it is a show and they're kind of participating, they're feeling the energy. And then there might be over time the odd little chat within the actual class itself, Absolutely. or whether it's after the class, before the class, if you might see them around. Um, have you noticed anybody who started coming to your classes, like basically like in a PE kit, and they're there <laughs> and changed? I've well, I've already said like there's double figures minimum people that have bought, bought the shoes mm -hmm. that I wear because I recommended that they get them. Do you know what I mean? So that kind of, I suppose that kind of answers that. So definitely, you, I would say is like you're an, Im, I am definitely an influencer in my space, <laughs> but not like, you know, you think influence and you're like, oh, I've got all these followers and stuff like that. Nah, but like in your actual community, do you hold an influence? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And it's but I'm pr like, I don't take that for granted. I'm pr and I'm proud of that, that people would be like, oh, I'm going to listen to what he says because. They, yeah, they want that's a respect thing and, and, and it's a trust thing. And, but I feel like I've earned that trust for those people to, you, the, my, yeah. my people to do that. They, they know that you're only recommending them the best quality. 100% would be best for them. And, uh, yeah, it's just easier rather than to, to trust a person than it is to, you know, Google and read like 20 different reviews. 100% take your chances and all the rest of it. Uh, yeah, the, Watching people change, um, I think like group exercise is such an interesting, I remember uh, my stance on group exercise changed a lot, but only because it's changed a lot. So agree. I don't disagree with my stand starts on it like 10 years ago, uh, because 10 years ago it was Les Mills and, you know, I, I can't even remember body attack and all these other kind of things. And they, 
they were huge and they got fitness help from loads of people and so credit to them. But I, the programming behind these classes wasn't around how do I get people fit? How do I get people strong? How do I teach people how to exercise? It was just about let's make it really hard and let's make it really fun. And it definitely appealed to like um, one particular demographic rather than everybody. Yeah, for sure. And then what I saw was over time, group exercise started to become more open in the sense of it became more about training and more people that were into training got more involved in it in terms of the programming aspect. So you start to see it change, you start to see lifts um, coming into group exercise classes, you start to see mobility exercises. You start to see cardio conditioning start to come into play. Yeah, just to set a structure, everything like that you would have in a normal training program start to get weaved into group exercise. Um, and then it's like, yeah, it's then sort of like weekly structured over time. So now you've got people actually getting fit. Yeah, for sure. Tell well, I think this slice is, I think it's a natural evolution. I, I don't think I, I would draw a parallel from that to PT. But if you uh, looked at the level three that you did, how long ago did you do your level three? <laughs> I don't remember. Like, exactly. Um, years and years, right? That you did it. It would have been 20 years ago. Did you have any, did you have any actual mobility components in the level three? Technically, I'm going to say yes. Okay. Because um, I definitely did it. Here's the thing. The level threes actually did have a lot of stuff in them. We, however, would do the level threes, skip past most of it because we didn't understand why it was there. We were filled in the program cards just past the assessment, and then we were lost because it was very boringly presented. Yeah. But there was some basic fundamentals in there. We were like, I don't know what your um, level three was like, but I had to write out a 12-week program. Yeah, me too. I had to put in warm-up exercises. Some of those exercises were mobility-based exercises. I didn't know what mobility was because the course didn't do a good enough job. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's more like it, those things weren't, I feel like when I did my level three, they, those things just weren't as apparent and how, as how, like how important they were. Mobility, stability, all these kind of things that are massive before you look at like loading and, and all these other parameters that you need to do, that you need to look at to, to progress someone to a level like, if you're not mobile and you're not stable, then why am I, why are you loading? Do you know what I mean? And it's, so that wasn't covered in my level three, for sure. There wasn't yet yeah, the, the reasoning um, of why you would do any of these things. I think a lot of us maybe had just the attitude of, all right, this is just something I've got to get through. I've been going to the gym anyway, and I'm just going to make everybody do what one million that I do. That's it. And that's, but that's also, I feel like that attitude is why a lot of people don't make it in our industry. Like, they, you, like because they, you have to you have to be willing to learn you there's a lot be. of adapting i i definitely am one of the people that got into personal training probably not necessarily for the best reasons yeah for sure and i didn't really factor in working with people and i just lucked out that that bit was interesting enough for me to keep working at getting good at you know training people and communicating with people whereas what I often see is people turn up and they're kind of like, yeah, I think it's actually very different now because of social media than it was back then. Yeah. Before it was like, I just really like going to the gym and people asking questions. So I think I can do it. And now it's like, ah, oh, um, this is a gateway to being Insta famous. Um, and I, and I mean that in a very objective way. I know you're like making faces, but it's, I think a lot of people do see that now, like, okay, I'm in my office job, I'm going to the gym in the evening, I'm kind of getting into like fairly good shape myself, maybe I'll post one or two things on Instagram, oh, okay, I'm getting some likes, maybe I could be an influencer, what's my next step, I know, I'll go become a personal trainer, I don't know how they connect the two, but they do. Yeah. Um. So I'm not sure how many people are getting into you know, personal training or even, um, I, it might be different actually with group X. I'll ask you in a second, like what the motivations are for people getting into these things now. Um, I feel are very different, like personal training, I definitely think is, is very social media driven. 
Um, and then it's just luck as to whether somebody actually likes working with people yeah, or whether it's kind of like, oh, I don't like working with people at all. No one's listening to me. Um, all the things I do for myself doesn't seem to work on. Doesn't work out everyone else. And now, yeah, for yeah sure. like, would you, why can't you deadlift? Why is, would you mean your back is hurting? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 not about it, but oh, man, that's just the physical aspects of, of like, oh, that movements don't work with the same for you as they do for someone else. People move in different ways, but like, that's just one level or one layer. And then when you look at like, and you look at the kind of like the mental aspects of stuff as well, like, why are you not motivated to train or mm. why can't you, why can't you, uh, understand what this, what, why I'm asking you to eat like, I eat like this or do this or have this or get up at this time or go to bed at that time. And why can't you, because that's what I do and it works. You're like, cool, but you don't have two kids under three and you know, this stress and that stress. And you don't realize that that's one thing that, you know, for me has been the most important, one of the most important things about, uh, working with people is taking everybody at that individual level and being like, cool, just because I've got this system that's worked for this person, that person for me or for whoever doesn't mean that it's going to work for this person. Mm. And it's having a framework is great. If you don't have a framework, then you're kind of clueless, right? You have a toolbox of things that you can use and strategies and stuff. But being a good coach is going into that toolbox and, and, and sharing your tools with people and being like, do you know what, for what you have for, if you know, for the, for the, what you're struggling with right now, I reckon this tool is going to help you and get it out of your toolbox. And you're like, cool. And then being able to be, if it's wrong, being able to be like, cool, that wasn't the right tool. That's all right. And I think it's really important when you, with clients, I always take, I always take them on that journey and being like, we won't always get everything right all the time. Do you know what I mean? I think you want to have like, if you're not progressing, then you're, then it's like, you know, you're a failure. Or if you're, mm -hmm. if you don't get all these wins, then you're a failure. It's not, and it's just a journey. Like I'll have, I've been in the last, probably the last four weeks of training, four, six weeks of training for me. I've been in, it, my motivation has been low. My training's not been as good as it has been in the previous time. And these things happen in life. Do you know what I mean? But then it's like, cool, I need to go to my toolbox and for me, when that happens to me, the best thing to do is just to go simple on everything and strip back all the complexity and just go back to doing simple stuff and ticking boxes and then taking it back up when things start to feel, when, when, when things start to feel better, because they always do. But do you know what I mean? Like, so um, it's, it's actually quite, um, well, one of the things that would be, uh, interesting to know, cause you're you're like obviously super, super, super into to uh, strap fitness conditioning everything. Now, um, you've like spent a lot of time, kind of, you put a lot of training hours in at this stage. So you you've kind of probably evolved over the years from maybe being focused on one or two things to now like kind of like focusing on everything. Absolutely. Um. And you get people coming into like your classes and they might not be like starting anywhere at this point in time. Um, but when it comes to stuff that's like really advanced, like Olympic lifting, for example, and, um, stuff that isn't necessarily advanced, but very hard, like cardio conditioning, um, where is the, what patterns do you observe? Like where do people do really well? to start um and then you see those people kind of like they start in this place and then you start to see them get much 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 better and where do people kind of like go wrong where like they've tried to go down this road and try and do these things and it's not quite worked out for them the the simple answer to that is just too much too soon is always a killer um like with any of the stuff that you do you have to i always keep saying the same thing you have to earn the right or you have to be yes, like as an example. So my training now, I train, I, I I do CrossFit now. That's what I do. Like I don't like the cliche. I'm a CrossFit or whatever. Like, but like CrossFit is what it is. What I do. Like that's the that's the style that I train in. So, um, strength strength and conditioning, Olympic lifting, gymnastics, like a, a rounded approach to to fitness. CrossFit is like the modality. Right. Um, but that was a 
it was tough for me at the start because I've been training for 10 years, 12 years, not more than that, 15 years, probably like uh, training wise. Um, and I had a level of like, cool, I was strong. I've always, like, do you know what I mean? Like I've been strength training, squatting, deadlifting, benching, these kind of things. And then functional stuff as well. It always had been there, but then certain things, certain aspects, like movement patterns, like when you're going into like kipping and the gymnastics work that I, that was a, a new ground for me, uncharted territory, Olympic lifting as well was, I was not, uh, like I haven't done as much because it's technical and I'd never, and I hadn't taken the time to learn it. So going into that, it's like, cool, for X, Y, Z, I'm up here in like, in the, in, uh, in the top, but for this stuff, I'm here. It's not nice. Right. And you're like, cool. Why can't I just do this straight away? And you try and do too much too soon. Mm. So I remember trying to do, I was like, I'm going to be doing, I want to do these pull-ups, butterfly pull-ups and I want to do them, but I hadn't there's a, there's a scale of what you have to have to be able to do them, right? You have to climb the ladder. Mm. Do you have A? Yes. Move to B. Do you have B? Yes. Move to C. Do you have C? Yes. Move to D. And eventually you unlock stage by stage, different levels of your, of your fitness and your training. I went from A to G and it got injured straight away. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Straight away. Boom, gone and shoulder months, couldn't do anything. And I was like, all right, cool. Like check your ego and just follow the steps. And so I think that's one thing that's tough for people is that they come in and we have like an unrealistic expectation of where you can get to in a certain time. And I think social media and maybe people that don't understand or trainers, especially I think sometimes trainers that are like really just really want you to be with them like, yeah yeah we can do it we can do it it can happen we can do it that no, it's no stress and you don't fit you then you don't climb the ladder so like where will people go wrong with doing cardio like but getting a good engine they'll go straight into only doing like really massively intense sessions and burn out whereas you know you need some steady state in there you know you need to do those longer, boring sessions, you know, getting into those. Then you, then you're layering different levels of training. And as you increase your capacity, then you can increase your workload. You can increase your volume and increase your intensity. And that's how you grow, right? But a lot of people want to go, they see, oh, that person's doing this and that looks really cool. So I just want to do that straight away. But like, cool, but you haven't, you haven't earned the right to do that yet. Does that make sense? No, it completely makes sense. And it's really... I guess I'm kind of trying to tie together the whole thing from, you know, being a child that, you know, needs to, needs these things to, to fit in, um, to, you know, being an adult that also like wants these things maybe just fit in. But then when we talk about, um, the training side of things, like how many times have you seen somebody do certain, like, you know, rep 200 kilos on the squats right like, and you you feel you're jealous right you want it <laughs> I, I, i'll yeah. give a prime example of this man it's like uh, we went we did, i competed on sunday last week uh at like my first it was uh called winter soldiers right so crossfit competition it's the first like real licensed crossfit event that we did we did one back in september but it was just like at a box it was like a, a birthday event for them and we had a really good time there and we thought oh we'll go and do a proper one why not? Like as a team, right? It was fun. But we went into the elite category, right? I've got people, uh, one of the, um, one of the guys that we were in my team, David, he's been doing CrossFit for a long time. That's where he belongs. He's solid there. Sophie as well, my friend and, and the other girl there that have been coaching for a while. I've been doing CrossFit for a while. I've been doing it for like a year and a half, man. Like I had no place there. <laughs> but because that people are like, oh, you're a big guy. You're going to be strong. You're going to be this. I'm like, yeah, but I haven't. I haven't got the time. I got, haven't had the time in the in the game to do it, and we got pasted in every workout. But it was fun. Like I had a great yeah. time. But um, I was just chatting to some of the guys. Like, we were all in that. You're always in the same lane when you work out. So you're always next to the same people. I was chatting to the guys. I was like, oh, you know, my first one this year. And they went, oh, cool. And I was like, how long have you been? 
doing this for? And I'm like, oh, I've been competing for 12 years. And you know what I mean? It's just like wild. But I had a moment we were doing the, one of the uh, workouts was like a max lift. So I had to do one clean and two jerks. That was the lift. That was the complex. And I went for a PB and it was like 105. And I was like, really like stoked for it. And a guy next to me hit 155 or 160 or something. And I was just there like, cool. And in that moment, what I should, <laughs> I should just be happy that I PB'd, man. Yeah. But you can't help but compare. But you don't know. I don't know his training history. I don't know how long he's been doing it. Even if I did and, those, and he'd been training for the same amount of time as me and he just had that extra... I should just be worried about myself. But okay. you can't help it but compare to everyone. And you're just like, oh, why am I not the best? Or why am I not as good? It's super, super tough. I mean, some of the people that I've spoken to are like, some of, I, I know these like really, 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 really strong guys. And, you know, like you're definitely one of them. And there's like, a, there's literally a dozen people I can think of on top of my head right now that can lift some super heavy weights that can do like, um, distances in times that are pretty ridiculous and every single one of those people I talk to um, they've all got their eye on the next person that can 100% man that's it doesn't matter like they'll, but the further you go up like I remember when I did um, I remember I was like back in the no, probably like summer last year and I was like going for a good strength phase and I hit like peak deadlift and I was like should be happy with that if I look back on myself Two years ago, I would literally do anything to have that. And then I look there and I'm like, I need to do more now. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want, that's fine. But you, you get a fulfillment from it, obviously. But then I don't know, there's just that desire. I don't know if everyone has that, but I definitely have that. But I think I have that not just for lifting, I have that for a lot of stuff in life. Like, yeah. I have that, you get to a certain level, but then you're like, cool, but I want more now. I've I've definitely come across um, so like you know I, I try and look at the psychological reasons for you know why people are doing the things that they're doing you know why the children not so much because kind of like their kids we used to let them be kids right let's not worry about that too much but adults after a certain point in time it's like if you're still demonstrating the behaviors that you demonstrated at twelve like what is it um, what haven't you like uh, had a conversation about yet and for a long time uh no well not always but maybe in the last few years not this year because this year i stopped but the two years prior to that i became like the the level of negative self-talk that was going on when i was training was insane if anybody heard what i was saying to myself like it was absolutely i'd be you know, like say if I'm squatting and I'm like, oh, this is nothing. The average person can do 20 reps at 200 kilos and here's you struggling with 100. You're like, this is good. You're just shit. You're this, you're that. And I would make up these lies in my head that the average person can do this and you do this and therefore you're per se. And I was thinking in my time at the time that I was like, yeah, it's okay because I'm actually using this to drive myself. I didn't realize the impact it was actually having on my mental health, which was like tanking hard. And I was constantly depressed because, you know, I, I was never, ever going to be able to live up to this stupidly unrealistic standard um, that I'd created for myself. On top of that, I, you know, there's things I know about people in fitness that maybe doesn't get talked about as much. Um, that maybe then that, that doesn't apply to me, right? Yeah. So I may be comparing myself to people that are in situations that I'm not in. Yeah. And it's like, right, well, yes, you, of course you can rep 200 for, um, you know, like 10 reps or whatever. Uh, because there's things going on in the background that are not going on over here. And like, yeah, stuff that's being taken <laughs> and stuff that's being taken. Sure. Um, but at the same time, not wanting to discount the, the, the effort and time and commitment and consistency and, you know, being like the sacrifice that, that individuals put in. For sure. Because they're still, what you know, it yeah. doesn't matter what you take. If you don't do the work, it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't yeah. happen. It's not magic. Nice. Um, there's a big 
self-esteem issue in well in the world but oh, in fitness in fitness and and a body image as well is more and more the more the more time i spend in, in this whole area the more the that body image is massive yeah for me i i found now more than ever that is so important to me. like it i i don't want it to be as important to me as it is does that make sense I don't want it to matter as much as it matters. I mean, me. I've I've definitely noticed you are keeping yourself in much better shape now than you were like two or three years ago. Oh, well, a hundred percent. But I think also my whole situation and the my whole uh, kind of like my whole job is completely different now to what I did when we worked together. When we when I when I was at Virgin, my job was was very admin admin heavy it was very high stress in terms of like all, you're always on in your like call i'm getting an email at six in the morning i'm getting an email at 10 at night they're on my phone i'm invested i have to deal with things straight away as soon as they pop up there's not really any time for family so that level of like stress and even then like training as well would have been like cool i'm training but someone's going to come to me while I'm training and they're going to have a problem. So I'm going to leave my training or it's not going to be that plugged in. Does that make, you know what I mean? Like all of those things. Whereas now for the last, for the last like two years, I've lived like an absolute athlete. I just coach people, train, eat, time all my food around my training and training has been the most, like that's been the most important thing apart from family, yeah. like literally family training, coaching has been my, has been everything. and. I've, it's it's been so good. There's a good love it like reference point or you know test for one of better words for you right now. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a bit of information and I want you to kind of like think about um like how much how, what you feel about this bit of information. So <laughs> in November, um uh, the the club that you know you used to work at with me. Uh, just at 100k revenue i know her for fast and you don't think how do you me straight away uh, uh, very away you did straight away uh, now like how much do you like relative to how you would have felt i, <laughs> I thought i feel immense happiness for hadi serious like i have no problem with uh, with like virgin active it, for me, it was 10 years of my life that I gave mm. to build myself up to a certain level. And I did that. And obviously, I'm not going to go into detail about what happened and why I left because it's done now. It's finished. It's over. Um, but it also has helped me massively because I will now I have so much better boundaries with how I work now. Whereas before I had none, if, if the work was like, I need you to do this, we need you to come in at six and I need you to come in at six and stay till 10, I would do it. Or I need you to go online now and reply, reply to this email, even though it's your day off, I would do it. But you know, all these things and they're just not healthy things. And I think as much as it was like, it was my fault because I allowed it to happen, but also like the company shouldn't really expect those things of you in the first place. And it just was, that's just how the expectation was. And, it, it, and where, what I do now, my boss sent an email and she was like, uh, she put me into it and asked me to do a task. And I texted her because I just happened to be on my email to look for, I was programming and some of the programming that I needed to use was in my email. So I had to go on, saw the email. So I texted her and said, oh, I'll put this in in a bit. And she was like, no, it's your day off. You shouldn't even be looking at it. Do it when you're back. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's just a different, it's a different, uh, different vibe now. It was one of the things I was actually curious about was third space. Talk to me. <laughs> I, I've never actually been to a third space and I don't know much about the company. I remember, um, maybe like 10 years ago, like the name started floating about and it was like this sort of like exclusive luxury club. Um, yeah. And I didn't know anything about it. And I had very little interest in exclusive and luxury anyway. And so I didn't really bother to 
to delve that much deeper into what was going on. And now it's much bigger in terms of it's expanded. It's more name. More people I know have gone to work for them. And I do obviously get like mixed messages about what it's like as a company, um, what they represent, what their ideas are. Um, I don't want to be like massively controversial because I, I don't, I don't have any, I'm not invested in the brand in, in whether they, they, you know, how well they do that, how well they don't do. Um, what do you, and, and obviously you've worked at, we're just talking about Virgin Active and now we're talking about third space and, you know, we're obviously suggesting that the, the expectation for work-life balance is a little bit different. There's also this, I think I will frame that though and say that the job role that I have now versus the job role that I had at VA is different. That's fair. So for me to say that everyone feels like I feel now, I couldn't say whether they do or don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like someone in a position that is similar to the position that I held at VA might have a different opinion. Yeah. And I, I'm not saying that they do or they don't, but I'm just saying that it would be wrong for me to try and frame it and say, but yeah, I think for me, I didn't, after I left VA, I was like, I don't really feel like I want to, I don't really want to work anymore for a big company like that. I'd invested a lot of time. I felt very hurt by, by that. You know what I mean? I felt like I'd given X, Y, Z. And when it came to it, I was just brushed aside and that was it. I was just another cog and that I'd just be replaced straight away. And no one really cared. That was it. Do you know what I mean? And it made me wonder like, cool, like if I'm going to invest that much of my energy and that much of myself, it needs to have a better return than just being for, for a sh at the end of the day, just to, for a shareholder. That was what it felt like a VA. I think my job now has changed because what I do now on a daily basis is I go in and make people's lives better. Like in, not in a, not in like a righteous way or anything like that, but that is literally, that's my business is going and delivering endorphins to people. And the energy that you actually get back from that is huge. So like I went into work this morning. I was tired, man. I'd been up the morning before at four, four thirty. I wake up to go into work. I'd not slept properly because uh, Holly had gone out and I can never sleep properly when she's out. And then, so I woke up, I didn't go to bed until probably like one in the morning yesterday. I got up at six to go to work today. I got there after my first class, I'm buzzing because you get what you give, you get back in terms of energy. And so it's just a completely different job, man. I can, I can imagine both from the, the change in the role, but also the change in the modality because, you know, dealing with group exercise and dealing with personal training, they can be two different things, um, in terms of what they are as a service and, and group exercise will always, always like should be exercise. Like it just, it, you go in, you go through the, you go for the workout and everything else on top of that. So everything else on top of that personal training can sometimes end up being a chat. Yeah, for and, sure. And almost no exercise going on depending on the needs of the client at that time and on that day and, and what you're kind of willing to accommodate. Um, I think a lot of what I was doing before as well was not, was, was just for, I think personally being in charge of myself and only myself has been massive for me because spent the last however long having my trainers, my PTs, having my group exercise instructors and you're at the end of the day judged for all of their actions. Mm. So does that make sense? So I'm, I'm judged because someone doesn't wear the right top or I'm judged because someone didn't turn up on time. Oh man, it, and that's all good, but for after a while, it's just exhausting. And to be able now to know that I'm in charge of, I'm just in charge of turning up and being the best version of me and then as long as that's that everyone's happy do, do you know what i mean it's a very big difference man i think that has energy true of any sort of 
management position. 100% like one of the reasons why a lot of people won't go down that road is because they don't want to be responsible and held accountable for a bunch of things that they're not really in control of. Um, it is always, uh, well, I don't know, actually. I don't, I don't want to unpack that, that conversation. That's a big chat. That is a big, it's a big chat because I sat on both sides of it now as well. But it, yeah, I d I'm not in a hurry to run back to that life at all. No, I, I've actually never taken that opportunity because um, when I looked at it, I was like, it doesn't really make sense for me to put myself in that situation. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't want to put anybody off doing it. No, no, I personally just, I have never looked at it and thought that that was a good idea for me. Um, I've always been happy kind of just managing myself and whatever I've got to do. Um, and I have been in situations where I've had to like manage other people in, in, in some cases. And what I learned was I have very little control. And actually, even as a trainer and with clients, I have very little control over what anybody else does. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm simply here to kind of be the best version of myself and influence within that micro level. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, you know, provide information and provide support in your toolbox. But what other people do ultimately is up to them. It's their, cho it's their choice. And they make their choices. And it just wouldn't make sense for me to be held accountable for other people's choices. Yeah, <laughs> I percent I agree. Uh, but that's kind of what happens. So I suppose well, it, not be held accountable, but it, you are, but then also then having to then deal with that as well is just exhausting, especially if it's s simple things. It's like, you just feel like, why, why am I doing this again? There is a, that was a, maybe, I think maybe that was a Mayfair thing, man. There, it, it was, it's, it, it, different places are going to be a bit more challenging than others. Um, third space from what I've been told uh it's a bit more like regimented a bit more monitored um the trainers are expected to to log their s uh, session programming yeah and, like some central computer yeah um so everything's kind of more quality control is much higher right and the, gen and the level of uh not to obviously again sitting on the management side of virgin as for a large part of it, so it recruitment became a, a bums on seats. You need to sell this many, so you need to have this many people. Whereas, from th at third base, it's all about quality, and then the quality, and then nurturing that quality as well. And so the session, when you if when I walk into a session at third base, the first thing I'm like, cool. There's literally PTs everywhere, but they're all doing sessions. And then when you actually look at the quality of those sessions and what happens from start to finish, you're like, cool, that session is of, of a, that session is of a, of a really good standard. So like, you've got these two um, parallels and I've like, I guess I've always been interested, like when we, when we kind of looked at you were, a, you were a manager at the, at Virgin Active and I remember there was a conversation at the time with like us kind of working together in that sort of like as a management team. And, you know, my thing was always going to be more focused around quality. Yeah. Um, as opposed to important, the sales side of things. But I'm working off of theory because I actually don't have evidence to say that if you were to deliver better quality, that that would be better for revenue. Now you've kind of seen um, that, kind of in practice at third space do you think that it does work in terms of like are virgin active currently better off doing what they're doing right now and driving that revenue or would they be wise to take a page out of third space's book drive loyalty um, <laughs> i don't want to upset anyone but other people from people from virgin may not agree with what I've said in terms of like the recruitment strategy and how that works. And also it's now been all over oh, almost four years or three years since I, since I departed. So it could be that these things are very different. To be fair to them, there, are, there has been a big shift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a bit more of a, um, 
a shift towards quality. Uh, it's still virgin active and there's still like, you know, um, a focus on revenue. And when push comes to shove, they will just get bums on seats. But a lot more is going into being competitive, at, you know, at the level of quality. And they've, they've introduced classes into their clubs that I think are way more beneficial to their members. Um, you know, the program behind the classes is getting a lot better as well. And some of the people that maybe they have in the background are better than they used to be. So it's it's showing an upward trend. They for sure it can be coming in place. And so there's I think I, I was one of the biggest critics. Yeah, yeah. And even I'm able to sort of sit there and go like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to see you guys do things that make sense to me now. Yeah, that's and good. So that's always that's really positive. positive. And if the recruitment, I only know the recruitment at the club that you know I'm at. And to be fair. I feel like I've had some influence there as well. Cool. Where it's kind of like, you know, I'm, would I say something if you bought a certain type of person in and does anybody want to then deal with what I have to say? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But it's important. I think that, uh, in answer to your actual question, I think that quality is, is always going to be, uh, better for driving revenue in the long run anyway because quality will uh, quality will equal longevity so you're always looking for that lifetime value if you've got poor if you have a you know oh cool i need to have this many trainers in the building to be able to sell this many sessions but then that's there's just for argument's sake that three of those trainers deliver in poor quality they get five clients each those clients then have a poor experience that's 15 people they might stay a member but they're because they've had a poor experience they'll never do pt again so they'll they'll you'll churn those people they'll come in one side of the funnel go out the other end of the funnel and you'll never see those people again whereas if you have quality those people will come into the system and they'll they'll get results they'll be happy They'll be more likely to uh, stay longer. They're going to refer people. So quality is always going to equal longevity and it's always going to end, end in better. It's a better outcome. Always. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how I imagine it to be. Um, I can't see how, like in any business that, you know, you, you purchase anything from anybody and um, their likelihood of repeat purchase is purely based on whether you liked the food. Yeah, exactly. Whether it was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not good, you, know, go you go to a restaurant, if the food's shit, you don't go back. Right. If you have a great time and you're like, cool, I'm going to go back there. It's not, you know what I mean? It's not rocket science. Just, yeah, simply opening up more shops on the high street. Does it, is it going to, you know, if you're, yeah, exactly. If everyone's getting food poisoning every time you go, it's not going to, it's not going to increase. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it it seems pretty straightforward and I'm sure there's reasons as to why sometimes quality isn't placed right at the top of the, the list of priorities when it comes to recruiting, but you know, I guess that's neither of our problem, Eddie, definitely not mine. Um, all right, Harrison, uh, it's been super, super, super great chatting with you. Uh, this won't be the last time I'm sure. No, I think we've only, I would feel like we've only just started talking, man. I feel like <laughs> we could, we could, I could easily do, and we could keep this going we for could, a while. Definitely, we could definitely, um, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to having you back on and just uh, unpacking more, uh, more of your experience in the fitness industry, more of your experience in, in life and as a parent. Um, those are you know, some really big conversations that I think are worth um, who are finding out more about uh, and definitely looking to have you uh, have you come on and, and, and have a chat with Hattie as well out there. Oh, that would be mad. <laughs> we have to. That would be, that would be jokes. That's, uh, yeah. So there's, I, I kind of just wanted to, I guess, have you introduced in a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's been uh, it, it's it's kind of you know you're you're one of the more um, magnetic characters that was been part of my sort of fitness career because uh, you know, even today versus five years ago like when I first started working with you 
I'm I'm different. And the day's already like, you know, 15 years in. Um, how much more can I learn as a, as a fitness professional? How much more can I learn within the industry? Um, so it's really difficult for somebody to come in and have any impact on, you know, the way I do things or the way I see things. And uh, that time that I got to spend with you and the time that I spent, um, you know, in, in VA, which is not a company that I, you know, ever really thought I would get gain anything from. Um, I did, I learned a lot more about people, uh, a lot, a lot more about the value of relationships. Um, I learned a lot, uh, and, <laughs> not necessarily a good style, yeah. just style, fitness style, um, and just, Please. yeah. And just watching how, uh, how people respond to you, um, just watching the way you kind of like, uh, handle yourself and, and, and just the magnetism that you seem to emanate. Uh, it's been very, very inspirational and uh, no doubt I have taken some of that and carried it with me a little bit. So I appreciate it. Oh, bro. It's all good, man. All good. So yeah, in true podcast fashion, uh, in the meantime, before we get you on again, where can people find you on the socials? Oh, shit. That's <laughs> <Right. laughs> a joke. All right. It's just on Insta. It's my name at Harrison Bob Daniels. I'm not too, I'm not cool enough for TikTok or x or any of those things yeah. i have an insta that i might post on once in a while it was to go i'm sure story i'll keep the story updated with bubble tea thursday bubble tea thursday um you'll find me at the whale tea in greenwich bubble tea thursday you come and come and find out so many uh, so many potential sponsorship opportunities <laughs> oh <laughs> my, that'd be wild as well that'd be amazing uh, we'll see if we can make that happen but yeah, I'll, I'll obviously like to link your your handle amazing yeah in the in the comments um or wherever you're wherever you're listening to this cool amazing cheers my man thank you so much for having me on been a pleasure